1947, the threat of all-out war loomed in Palestine. With limited experience commanding large units, flying fighter planes, or sailing battleships, the Jewish underground fighters were at a disadvantage against the invading Arab armies. Prevented by the British authorities from legally manufacturing or buying ammunition or building the infrastructure for a modern army, the temporary Jewish government in Palestine turned to the diaspora for help. Jews around the world answered the call and volunteered, putting their lives on hold, leaving behind home, family, and jobs to help their brothers in need. I was not just an adventurer. I wasn't a soldier of fortune. We were never a party, never politically involved in this kind of Zionism or that kind of Zionism. And that didn't matter to us much. We just loved Israel. Part of my motivation in becoming a Zionist, part of it was a sense of having a refuge where Jews could come if they wanted to and if they had to. And Israel needed people who had war experience. Israel needed war supplies. Israel had literally nothing. My mother, bless her, gave me a kiss and wished me good luck and said, you're doing the right thing, son. A kiss and out the door. Yeah. At the end of the war, I was admitted to the Harvard Law School. We began to learn about the concentration camps, what really went on, and about the Jews trying to get out of Europe to get into Palestine. And I, by sheer chance, grew up in the United States, nurtured school, place to eat and sleep all the time, secure. And there was an imbalance here, a real imbalance. I had the good life and they had horror. It was an imbalance that had to be righted. I mean, we couldn't just sit in law school while this was going on. This was history being made. We didn't go back to our second year in law school, just didn't go back. We flew us down to Miami, the Palmach guys from New York, where they took us dockside and there was this, this hulk. It was a uh, boat that didn't inspire confidence. We prepared our ship, which carried 20 officers and men. We prepared this ship so that it could accept and safely carry 1,500 people. We took the ship to the coast of Italy to pick up our Mapilim, and then I remember the Mapilim coming from the shore. When you see human beings who have individual characteristics, they're not just concepts, they're real people, and there are the numbers, and they're Jews, they're, they're like me, we're fellow Jews, and what they've been through. It was a profound experience. There was a call out in South Africa by word of mouth to volunteer to come over and help the new state because all the big Arab countries around us were just pouring in to destroy this tiny little fledgling state that had come about after 2,000 years. The Haganah people came to meet us and they said, you're going to take a boat with the new immigrants and you're going to sail across by boat. We got near to Haifa and it was evening and the boat was nearing the shores of Eretz Israel and we saw the lights of Mahar Carmel coming on and somebody, one of the people down below, started to sing a tikva. And all of us stood on the deck as the boat, boat approached Haifa and we were all singing our tikva. And then one of our boys said the prayer, and all together we said Amen as the bird moved into Haifa. And there were tears in all our eyes. And we got off the bird. Everything was dark. And they interviewed me. And I told them about myself. And they said, of course you can be a nurse. We don't have nurses. You can be a nurse if you know something, even if you're willing. And they gave me instructions, and this lady, one of the chayalot, came and said, come on, I'll take you to where you have to go. She took me to the, um, the quarters where I would sleep that night, and she took my hand, 
and then she put her arm around me and she said, don't be afraid, it's dark because of air raids, but you'll be taken care of and you'll do something special for Eretz Israel. And I never saw this lady again, but she really gave me the courage. I arrived in Israel, spring of 48, before the state of Israel was created. So we had a little ship with potatoes. And under the potatoes, we had Spanish Hispano 20 millimeter guns, new guns with grease. New stuff, no, how to shake out the zacha. Finally got new stuff. But the point was, what are you gonna do with the potatoes? They get rotten. And we got the guns, and then they sent me to Panmach the same day. As we moved south, we got involved with the Battle of uh, Fallujah. We had a certain amount of chutzpah that we should not have, uh, have had. And when I saw the plans, I knew it was very chancy. We had 400 fighters. The Egyptian brigade consisted of almost 3,000 men. And it was raining all the time. And the troops were tired. And then we were ordered to attack. Pruga that broke into the town and village. Pruga bet. I heard my cousin saying that the Kval Kmat Beyoden already had prisoners. Suddenly I got an order to go all the way around to Bedjibrin because the situation was deteriorating. And it did. By the time I got there, on the other end, the battle is over. Puga Bed, my cousin, got wounded again, and my second in command that I sent was killed. Otherwise, he had another one or two other wounded, wounded or killed, I don't know. And Puga Gimen, the religious company, got the brunt, and only 14 escaped. I never realized that there was no soldiers between us and Bet Romano, Bet Tel Aviv, that was the headquarters, there was nobody. Because the rest of them were fighting in El Arish and all the other places. We stretched ourselves thin to the point. So I was basically the only Koach left. The war was a difficult war. I was a chemistry major. Israel had some guns, but they had no munitions. And they wanted to be able to manufacture munitions, bullets. So our mission was to develop a bullet from the material available to the uh, Jews in Israel uh, and to be able to get them back to them on time. At one point, there was an alarm, and we all scrambled, took all our papers and chemicals, put them away, and a whole set of other papers and chemicals. I looked about this whole thing, very strange. Turns out the FBI was coming. So they came and they left. And of course they winked, you know. They knew what it was all about and we knew what it was all about. We weren't going to say anything. So as they left, everything went reverse. The stuff we're working on came out. Did we succeed? I think we did at the end. And we got the formula uh, and they were able to manufacture the bullets for the Davidka. We had to take a hill. How do we take a hill which is full of Egyptian infantry, backed by artillery? 4.30 one morning, a surprise attack. We were halfway up the hill before they knew what was coming, and we took it. I think it was a bloody miracle. We took it. The next day, they sent out four guys with two bezels. They were the big machine guns with bullets this big, you know that could pierce armor. And the bezels got to work on the road and stopped the tanks and stopped the armor from coming through. They were just stuck there. And of course, they sent troops up every day and they dive-bombed us with Spitfires, which I got crazed about. Spitfires were defending us in London. That feeling of a homeland at last when nobody could kick you out, it was yours. 
and it was a marvelous feeling. The first act of the newly established state was to abolish all restrictions on immigration. Between 1948 and 1951, over 700,000 Jewish immigrants streamed to the state of Israel, doubling its population. Ben Gurion happened to call me and says, we need fast action because we've opened the gates now. Ships are coming in every day and we understand that you're familiar with housing. I want you to know we have no money. We got there and the first thing the next morning, we have a meeting set with Ben Gurion. He's over there behind his desk in this little makeshift building in there. And he stands up behind the desk like this and he puts out his arms and he says, New Isidore, where's the houses? <laughs> but people said, Israel has no raw materials. There's no metals, there's no wood, there is no timber, there is no material to build housing with, so you're gonna have to import them. It just so happens that reinforced concrete, which is a brand new item, people know it was only being discovered or used when I was in college. And making reinforced concrete is a very simple operation, and anybody can do that, and you can put them to work, and all you need is one little machine, uh, smaller than an automobile, and you can put it anywhere you want to make, any town, any place you want, you put it, and as long as you're shoving it, put in some crushed rock and some sand and water and cement. That's reinforced concrete. We set up an industry, we made a design of the type of uh, houses you'd see in California or Florida. They were setting new town for these people to go out and start inhabiting the, these towns. Whatever I had to give, I wanted to give it to the Jewish people, and I knew that when I was having the best life possible, imaginable in Boston, successful with the practice of the law, comfortable financially, everybody's happy and healthy. It's not what I want out of life. You have to do things sometimes, even if it's done uh, quietly, even if it's against the law, but there's a higher law we had to obey, and it worked out, thank God. To be there in 48, and to be involved in the things we were involved in, we felt we were very lucky. To have missed that would have been, I think, rather sad. Two things happened. I had a small part, an active part, in the creation of the State of Israel. But the biggest reason I remember that, because of my coming and getting involved, I happened to meet one of the nicest girls in the world, my wife. The Gahagana people who were escorting us, they didn't understand what I was doing. And one of the young men there, he came up to me and he said to me, what do you think you're going to do in Israel? There's a war on. Don't you think it would be dangerous? Who gave you permission to be here? So I said to him, Ani ba am shocha, ziha am shiri. And that is why I'm coming to help you, because I want to be part of your people, because I am part of your people. Mm -hmm.